John Cage's Third Construction. I play percussion one. And uh, in all of these, these um, parts, John Cage divides up the instruments into um, different groups. Everybody gets three drums, five tin cans, a shaker of some sort, a uh, clave, and then everybody kind of has some uh, miscellaneous instruments. In my setup, um, that's a china cymbal and a log drum and maracas. Um, as we as so put together the piece, uh, we made some choices on um, how we were going to divide up these instruments among the four of us. Um, and in my case, uh, we decided that percussion one would have the highest ten cans and kind of go down through players two, three, and four. And we made the decision that the drums would be the lowest and we would go up from there. Uh, the second player having higher drums, third, and the fourth player having the highest drums. Um, but John Cage gives you a lot of choice in the instruments that you're going to play and how you kind of divide that up amongst the group. Um, so in our version uh, that we just played, I'm going to walk through some of the choices um, that I made in my setup. Towards the beginning of the piece, I guess I start off with, um, with the rattle, with my, my shaker. In the part, he writes a, a North American Indian rattle. And when I first learned the piece, I actually looked in one of those little books that tells you how to make all different kind of instruments. And I remember I was a, a freshman in college, and it was like North American Indian rattle. So I took a little tin can and put a thing on it and used it for a long time, actually, into so, uh, used it for a long time. But finally found this, this rattle that sounds a little nicer. Um, for the most part, you um, play it pretty quietly. Uh, and occasionally he writes um, accents at the beginning, kind of on, on each bar. He'll give the group these whole notes. Um, that we accent every bar. And depending on the situation, So has made different choices on how to play that. Um, recently, we've started to each um, use a different instrument to kind of play those accents. So we'll do, given, given little pulses on the bar. Um, but kind of as we play in different halls and at different times, we make different choices. Um, we saw uh, the percussion group Nexus play when we were first learning it. And they did a really cool thing where they kind of hit their hit their arms to play these accents, and that was really cool. We do that every once in a while. We try to be sure to make choices on what's going to sound good in the space that we're playing. Um, so today we stuck with the, um, the second instrument playing those accents. Let's see, second in my part, um, I believe early on, I play a lot of maracas. He, um, he writes it kind of like on two, two uh, not two staves, but two lines of, this, of the staff to give you a high and a low in the maraca. Um, so in this case, I just chose um, a, a really little maraca and a slightly bigger one to give the two the high and the low. Um, Josh also plays maracas in this piece, and my part has most of the high sound, so I kind of go with, with these little maraca sounds. Um, and a lot of times, the maraca at the, at the beginning of the, of the piece is pretty small. And you get the kind of the high and the low. Um, like I said, depending on when we're playing it, we all try to make some different choices. And um, towards the end of the piece, you get some bigger sounds. Um, sometimes I'll bring out kashishi or another maraca to get that sound. Um, recently, I've been sticking with these because they sound, they sound pretty nice with Josh's big, big maraca sound. Um, let's see. Next is the tin cans. And like I said, mine are the smallest in the group. Um, we chose that because... Um, it felt like my, my part, the cans are less important and the drums are more important. They come in the climactic points. Um, so the, the little cans happen early on for the most part. Um, and these are our little paint cans um, that we got empty. <laughs> we didn't empty them because that could be rough. We, we bought them empty at the hardware store. Um, and these have been beat up. They've kind of gone through the ringer a little bit, but in, in general, they're high sounds. Um, we've gone back and forth with different ways to play the cans, but um, Recently, we've been playing with a lot of rattan, which sounds really good on, on the cans. Uh, in my case, I use these, these vibe mallets um, in other parts of the piece to play the, play the cymbal and sometimes to play, to play over here, too. So we use these rattan. He marks to play on the, on the can and, and on the sides of the can. So um, on the can, they sound real nice. And he marks to play on the edge of the can, too. Um, on all these instruments, uh, the drums and the cans, he kind of gives you this, this edge and center of the can, which is kind of cool. You have five instruments, but you get ten sounds. Um, and it's something that, especially on the, the cans, you can really hear. 
um, like I said, we went back and forth with a lot of different instruments to play the cans. And depending on um, different spaces, we, we may choose different different things. Recently, we've really gone with rattan because uh, the edge specifically, they sound pretty nice uh, compared to. Uh, you can get the edge to really come through. Uh, with this and occasionally he gives you little funny things in my part you tip up the can towards the end of the piece and play really quietly um, and so I've been playing with this uh, this vibes mallet this kind of soft yarn mallet on it um, you know it gives you like this quadruple piano I don't even know how to say that in Italian um, really tiny sound and he says to tip it up which is kind of funny because I'm sure the cans he was working with uh, there's a really specific sound with that, uh, but we still kind of do that to try to give, give a slightly different taste. Uh, let me see. Next, uh, I think I, I, I play some drums early on as well, and as we've spent more and more time with this piece, so has been playing this piece since 2000, probably 2000, since the year 2000. So we've been playing it a lot, and we'll, we would tour it for you know maybe three or four years, and we'd put it away, bring it back, put it away. Um, and so we've made some different choices on how to play the drums as well. Uh, a lot of groups play um, the whole piece with just your fingers. We did that for a long time. Um, a lot of groups also play with sticks uh, because it gives it a bigger kind of raucous feel. Um, and recently we've made the choice to start the piece out with fingers to kind of let it unfold slowly um, and to bring sticks in the second half of the piece. If you check out the score, um, there's a moment in, in Adam's part um, that Tiffany sticks are marked, and so we use that that point as a kind of point of departure to go to, to um, some harder tom tom sticks after that. So early on, play the uh, play the tom toms with fingers, and like I said, he marks the center and the the edge as two different sounds. Um, so you'll get little patterns like. With the center and the edge. Um, we worked with a really great choreographer, Elliot Feld, who did a, a choreography of this piece. And he had a really kind of raucous approach to it. Um, actually, when, when we played in that ballet, we played it all with sticks, and it was really big sound. And it's really fun. Um, so we kind of took, took a little bit of that, and later on in the piece, um, we'll slam a little bit more with drumsticks, or in this case, with, with timpani mallets. Because um, it's, it's really climactic. And, and the way So used to play it, I think we tried to bring a big climax, but there's only so loud you can get the drums with your fingers, you know. So we would go with sticks. Um. The same thing, marking the edge and, and, and the center. Um, Really, I think on the tom-toms, depending on the drums you choose, you can hear that more or less at different times. Um, but it definitely gives a feel um, to some of these different figures going over the bar line, how he writes the, the edges and the centers, which is very cool. So we try to slam at, at the end a little bit more. Um, also, as we've played this piece, the, the drums have kind of um, you know, developed as well. When we were in school, we had Chinese tom-toms that we could play with. Um, so we would mix and match some Chinese drums with some um, some tom-toms. Um, now we don't have Chinese toms, and depending on where we are, you know, it's easier to, to tour with the drums or not. So I play um, the lowest tom-toms in the group. Um, and in this case, Adam also plays similar tom-toms, and we put some different heads on them. Uh, my heads are pretty thick. Um, they're coated pinstripes. They're, they're just kind of what we had. Um, we did a, we did a recording session. We really like the sound, and they've kind of, it's kind of stuck. But a pretty pretty muffled, um, low kind of raucous sound. Because uh, in my part, this comes in at a climax. Um, moving through the couple more instruments that I play, um, I play clave occasionally, and and we all do. Um, the patterns on the clave are really really quick, um, and we've made some choices at different different times to play it the clave down with two sticks, or to pick it up. Um, I play a part with, uh, with Eric and Josh that um, is kind of clave, um, it's an important clave moment. It's really quiet and really fast. Uh, so instead of playing two claves on top of each other, um, I play with a, uh, like a hard plastic mallet uh, to get a small sound, but to give you a little more facility, I guess, to, to try to struggle to get out these fast rhythms. They're, they're really fast. Um, but so on the clave, it would be something like,
these little chirpy sounds. And like I said, everybody has a clave, so at moments in the piece, he'll kind of orchestrate it. And just because claves have no specific pitch, you get these little microtonal cool, um, cool little melodies popping out. And, and we've made a choice to, to order ourselves um, in a way that brings out this melody with our, with our clave notes. I have a china symbol. It's marked really loud, obnoxiously loud, and I think Cage must have known that it was just gonna cover up everybody when you played it. Um, at moments it's marked like double forte or triple forte. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. Comes in mostly at climaxes. Um, play it with a, a yarn mallet that I use on other things. Just kind of slam on it, really. Occasionally, I, I think he probably has some kind of really weird, cool China symbol. Uh, he had a great instrument collection. Um, so right now we're, we're playing with this bigger, kind of the darkest China symbol I could find. Um, sometimes we mix it up and play with smaller, more funky things. And lastly, in my part, is the, um, the log drum, which um, we decided to play it today with these, uh, these two slats of wood. Um, occasionally we can play on uh, these beautiful African log drums, but most of the time when we tour, we can't bring the log drum with us. So we thought we would give you a feel of what uh, we would be playing like on tour, um, which oftentimes we'll throw these two pieces of walnut uh, in the suitcase to act as the log drum. We put it on this little weather stripping, which we do often. Um, and he marks a few different things on the log drum. He marks to play it with a rubber mallet and marks to play with your finger. Um, in this case, when, when everybody's kind of kind of rocking, the finger doesn't really speak. So um, in this performance, I played with some, some rubber um, in one hand and actually the back of a mallet on the other uh, to fill in for the fingers. I think Cage would approve, hopefully. Um, and there's a moment, this is kind of like a log drum solo where it really, uh, the texture clears out and it's just this part. With a little low rumble going on over in the, in the bull roar over there. Um, at, at other moments he marks for just fingers and though it actually sounds cool to play with just fingers on here, He marks it to go up to a, to a kind of larger dynamic. So I try to squeak by using the back of these sticks. Uh, um, I think with, we, we find with Cage's music that um, it's always important to really get into the score and get into where he was coming from and then realize that the reason he used a lot of these instruments is because this is what he had around. Um, so I think uh, for me, taking something like the log drum part and putting on it what we have around at the, um, at the show or on the road works. And when you do that, you may have to make a different choice. So he said fingers on a log drum. It sounds really beautiful on an African log drum. You may have to make some different choices when the, the case calls for it. Um, I think that's all I have out here in terms of sticks and, and instruments. Um, we threw in a, today, just in our space, because um, the acoustics, is, it was a little harder to hear. So at the bigger log drum moments, we went to a harder mallet on the log drum. Um, I just throw that in there to kind of emphasize that depending on where you're playing, you're going to have to make different choices on what you want it to sound like. Uh, I think the, the, for us, it's not a good way to go about it to say, like, I always play this, this instrument with a stick. Because inevitably, you're going to find yourself in some place where that stick doesn't sound like what it sounded like in your practice room or in your rehearsal space. So when you get on stage or when you get in, in the art gallery or when you get outside, you may have to make different choices depending on what you want it to sound like. And um, in my part, that example today was, was going to this harder kind of rubber stick on, the, on the, um, these wood slats to let them speak over everything. I think that's it. Thanks for listening. <laughs>